Yeah, we can go as long or as short as you guys want. So just uh, some of these sure. are like three hour conversations, others are short and sweet. So whatever you guys are feeling. I think maybe let's try to shoot for an hour and see how it goes. And maybe after that, we can sure. maybe keep going. So right. just a good, well, I'm game with whatever. Well, we are, we are now live. So welcome everybody. We're going to be uh, loosely talking uh, pests, IPM and a whole host of other topics. Uh, so welcome. Whoops, I just killed my video. And give me one second. There I am. And I'm going to pass the mic off to Ivan, who's going to lead the conversation. He's sure. uh, growing. Yeah, why don't you maybe start with kind of your grow and what's going on in, in Salinas. It's harvest season right now, right? Yeah, it is. Actually, I'm in. I'm right outside Salinas, so I'm in Aromas is where I'm at. That's where I'm currently at, which is about, about 20 minutes south uh excuse me north of salinas you know right next to watsonville so that's where i'm currently based at right now so it's a beautiful day out here happy sunday to everybody uh we've got some great guests tonight some good friends of mine colleagues that i've known for some time we have saul what's up saul are you there hey, <laughs> thank you for joining us so can you uh give a little bit about your background as far as um, you know ipm management and and uh maybe a little bit of history as far as what um uh, you know, how you got involved with, uh, with cannabis. Yeah. So I've uh, been in biocontrol for been work. Well, I've been doing IPM for organic crops now for about six years. Um, most of it heavy, uh, biocontrol. I like to call biointensive IPM, um, a couple of years in organic herb crops. And then I got hired at Harborside farms where I did a couple of years there, um, heavy on biocontrol um that's where we met <laughs> that's right met. yeah so ivan was a grower there i was uh the ipm manager um so um trying to make his crop look as as clean as possible um but yeah um i uh after a couple of years there um i got offered the position um this position on ipm specialist for beneficial insectary um that was the my go-to insectary when I worked at Harbor Side. Um, they offered me the job because I had a couple of years of background specifically in cannabis uh, pest management, and that's what I've been doing for the last last year or so. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, thank you for joining us, and we also have Chris, my good friend Christopher, from uh, Front Range Bioscience in the house. Say hello. <laughs> What's, up? What's up, Ivan? Good to see you, man. Thank you. Happy Sunday. So where are you at right now? Uh, I'm in Chicago right now visiting my folks. This is where I grew up. Just checking out to make sure they're not uh, driving each other too crazy. I think. For sure. Good man. Good man. So uh, uh, can you give us a little bit about uh, your background, where, uh, you know, how you got involved and, you know, how Front Range Bioscience has evolved to where it's at now? Yeah. So I kind of got into this backwards. Uh, what certainly wasn't anything I thought or intended to get into in the beginning. Uh, Front Range Bio started with two other business partners about four years ago. I was initially driving tissue culture work and then uh, propagation and micropropagation. And then stepped away from the business for a little bit and worked in veg crop pathology, mostly with cucurbits, melons, stuff like that. And then had an opportunity to move out to California, Monterey to work in a veg crop testing laboratory and did that for about a year and a half. That didn't work out so well because it was a startup and startups have their problems, of course. And then uh, I went back to working with Front Range from there, functioning mostly as a, as a pathologist, which I don't really have formal training in. My background's mostly in genetics and molecular biology, but I uh, had to learn a lot to do the testing work I did previously, mostly on the job. Really, really steep learning curve. And a lot of the systems and principles and ideas of which they work on in um, in veg crop pathology is the same thing that's going to apply and works with this crop as well. Um, so currently oversee all the pathology. I also work on the breeding uh, line characterization. Uh, Front Range has um, associations with uh, greenhouse out in Salinas partners with them. And so then, you know, anything, but we also have a big hemp operation, which is what we normally are known for. And that's what we do for uh, in Colorado. And so any plant testing, 
any viral testing, any pathology testing between our partners out in Salinas and uh, our greenhouses and our operations out in Colorado. I oversee and coordinate all that stuff in addition to some of the breeding and mine characterization as well. So let me ask you this. Do you see any trends, uh, California versus uh, maybe Colorado, as far as maybe uh, viruses or, or any pathogens that are more curated to the cannabis plant? Well, it's hard to say in some regards because, because the business or the crop has basically been in 50, 60 years of prohibition. We are really kind of at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding what's really a big problem. I mean, if you think about corn or you even think about, you know, other veg crops, they have like almost 100 years of pathology research um, behind it. You know, farmers know what the problem is. They can even tie it down to a regional scale. Um, but in cannabis, it's really difficult because a lot of maybe previous publications on it are a little bit outdated. And there's always new diseases that are coming to the front, which we've never really had the tools or the diagnostics to identify or you just because maybe you couldn't because maybe it was illegal at the time or maybe that you know hemp was tied into marijuana and so people couldn't really work on that kind of stuff so we're really starting to learn new things um just to answer your question directly trends uh hplvd which is hop latent viroid which is a problem that hopped over from sorry i didn't mean that pun that came over from hops um that's a big problem everywhere. Uh, BCTV, which was uh, oh, the B, B curly top virus. There's gonna be a million acronyms in pathology and I can't always remember all of them. Uh, I saw that first actually out in the Western Slope in Colorado with some farmers that we were working with, uh, but I think that's slowly making way west, largely because it's vectored or brought in by uh, leaf hoppers. And so I don't really understand or know all the range of leafhoppers, but in, in California, but we do have a hemp field trial going on with the University of California system. It's out in the Central Valley outside of Fresno and definitely many of our crops and our lines out there that we're trialing are starting to show indications of the curly top virus. So um, I think that's something that's probably going to spread, but because it's a virus that's vectored by an insect, it kind of depends on the range of the insect and whether the insect can you know, survive and live in order to pass that on. Um, I'd say those are probably the two largest problems that I'm seeing right now. I mean, there's a host of bacterial virus, uh, bacteria, bacteria and funguses, you know, depending on what you're trying to do in the system and your greenhouses, are you propagating, are you vegging? Uh, those are going to probably be more of a problem than less, but those two are probably our biggest, that's the biggest problem I have right now. Those are the two biggest diseases I deal with. Awesome. And, thanks. Uh, pardon me? Cool. Yeah. Thank said, you. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, yeah. when you go visit, when you go out and to field calls or visit different farms, um, what do you see? You know, what's maybe some of the challenges you see growers or, you know, anywhere from craft to large scale commercial operations? What's what's uh, any any trends you see with any particular size or as far as pest and and that well, goes uh, here in California? Yeah, every, everyone's becoming aware now of the uh, pop slate and viroid. Um, the, Everyone I meet talks about it. Everyone has it. Um, everyone's trying to get rid of it from their grow. Um, the bee curly top virus is relatively new. First I heard of it was a few months ago. Um, that is uh, vectored by leafhopper. Leafhoppers have a huge climate range. Um, not sure exactly which are the ones that carry it, whether it's uh, just you know the regular uh, Right. green leaf hopper that you find everywhere. Leaf hoppers don't tend to be a problem indoors or in greenhouses. I have seen, uh, believe it or not, an indoor grow that had a major infestation of leaf hopper. It's really weird. Um, it was um, probably um, all the leaves surrounding the grow um, that uh, they hadn't controlled outside and they were coming in. Um, as far as I know, he never experienced this, but it's just a matter of time, um, like Chris was saying, before it starts to spread. Um, so right now, all I've heard about bee curly top is um, a couple of grows um, east, actually, of uh, L.A., out in the desert, which is interesting because one of them's in the Mojave. Um, and you would imagine that's pretty hot. <laughs> yeah, over 100 <laughs> degrees. Yeah, um, leaf hopper is a miserable, uh, evil pest to try to control. I used to battle it in sage 
Um, and uh, it's, it's not very susceptible to, to many organic insecticides. Um, biocontrol is tough, um, but there are options. So, you know, that's, that's one to keep an eye on. Although, like I said, we're at the start of it. Um, and then of course, powdery mildew, powdery mildew and, and botrytis, they're, they're really kind of the two worst pathogens we know that they are bad pathogens now. We're uh, oh, yeah. not certain <laughs> about the others, right? We had our we had our good run ins in, in our past for sure, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, that was that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was good times for sure, just like anywhere. Um, but you got to remember, you know, every every garden is everybody says, oh, we're there's no issues, but that's false. I mean, everybody's dealing with something. You know, it could be at a very minute level to something that's just on the verge of being out of control, but you got to be proactive and, and be able to communicate that, you know, within your team. I think that's vital, you know, regardless of what's at stake, you know, I mean, of course you want to get to the end of your harvest, you know, absolutely. But at the same time, you have to make these decisions that, that are vital, you know, whether you act and harvest a little bit early or, or, you know, go into, you know, a major scouting mode, you know, so um, any, any tips you have for, for folks in their greenhouses or facilities as far as maybe scouting, maybe the value of that. Um, yeah. I uh, mean, maybe doing calendar spraying, you know, that, that, that type of, uh, um, that, those type of protocols. Well, you know, you, you're, you're probably asking me this because you know um, my personal opinion of, of monitoring the crop for pests and diseases. Right. Um, it is essentially in my view, it's the, it's the foundation of crop protection, right? Where Where is your problem? What is it? What stage is it in? And what intensity? If you know that, you know, you can make a reasonable pest management decision, right? So I encourage all growers that I work with to really spend the, the labor resources on monitoring. Um, in the cannabis community, I think that's, that's slowly becoming recognized by more growers that they really need to invest in the monitoring. Um, it's, it's a tough one because, you know, well, what I mean by monitoring, I don't, you know, I talk to some growers and they say, well, yeah, we monitor every day um, when we're, you know, irrigating or when we're de-leafing um, you know whatever we may be doing out there whatever cultural practice we're doing out there we're monitoring that's not what i mean by monitoring that is multitasking what you're talking about there i'm talking about putting your eyes on the plant specifically looking for pests and disease you know and that's that's very different and that means putting labor resources on monitoring and you know it's it's something that should be done regularly. I mean, as, as you know, at Harborside, we had, uh, we had the resources to do it twice a week. Um, it was helpful to keep, keep small problems from becoming wildfires. Um, yeah, you know, you, you'd stumble and fall every now and then. Um, it's, For sure. there's, there's hurdles to good, being a, a good scout, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, people that are trained to identify signs and symptoms of pests and diseases, um, that are out there on a regular basis for, for our, uh, certain number of hours a week. Um, to me, it's the foundation. Um, and I can't, I can't stress it enough. And I think having that communication, you know, within your team is, is, is vital when you start to see an issue, um, you want to, you know, you want to take care of it right then and there. We don't want to wait, yeah. wait, wait, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, I mean, yeah, we're all on, on a calendar. We all work. We try to stay to, towards those dates, whether it's a harvest date, whether it's a, you know, spraying date or, or scouting, you know. But sometimes, you know, we have to, we, we have to keep that communication uh, transparent so you can make those important calls, you know. Because, I mean, it's, I mean, you could lose a lot of money, you know, and the reality yeah, of it, no you doubt. know. Yeah, and yeah, and loser and uh, loser and loser jobs at the same time. You know that's what people don't realize. Yeah, that. I mean when you work, yeah, at a large corporation or a large company, sure you can have a couple of bad runs or what have you. But when you work at smaller facilities that are mom and pop, more, um, you know, the stakes are much higher. You know, a yeah. couple of bad runs could really, could really 
set you on a bad path and you're going to be just working towards recovery, recovery. That's why I, I feel like I having a good IPM program is just, it's vital. You know, I mean, scouting, I mean, I'm in the greenhouses, you know, looking at stuff because just from years and years and years, um, you know, you get to see the plant as far as if it, you know, if it's deficient in certain areas, you look at the roots, you look at the health of the roots, um, you know, and you just keep track of, you know, what you're feeding and how you're feeding the plant and how it's reacting. Cause each strain is, they're like, I mean, we're people. So each, each, each person is different, you know, so you have to learn to yeah. kind of cater to sometimes towards what that particular plant needs, you know? So, but anyways, yeah, um, for sure. Um, you know, I, I recommend to every operation that all of their cultivation techs know a little bit about, you know, signs and symptoms of pests and diseases but that you have specialists who are kind of your trained scouts that are, you know, are really, really good at it. Um, and then vice versa, those scouts should know to look for things that are odd, that are not pests and diseases, like herming, for example, be able to identify them. It's just the more eyes on the crop, the better. And if there's any crop, you know, in this country, any agricultural crop that in this country that's worth investing in, um, you know, this is it. And unfortunately, some people, you know, at the top can't, can't see that can't justify the, you know, the labor. Yeah, that's the challenging part. You're always going to have to plead your case all the time. But, yep. you know, you got to remember that it, it is still, a, you know, cash crop. So it's a, still a valuable cash crop, you know, when people don't realize is that, you know, quality will always sell itself, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. there and what's happening right now is that you know people are just being like okay well the market's hot we can have such and such product not as good quality but i mean quality should always reign supreme you know that should be your goal because regardless the size of your um, um of your operation you know small to large i mean you want to maximize um you know all your efficiencies but also still be able to cultivate a premium product you know and that involves teamwork and you know like i said ipm and you know, it's, it's a very interesting time for the industry, how it's evolving. You know, it's like science. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, it's finally real agriculture. Um, you know, it's exciting to, to, to think, you know, we're, we're kind of at the start of it all. Um, we, we really know, you know, like Chris was saying, we really know very little about this compared to other crops. And, you know, the, the amount of research that's gone into, for example, almonds or grapes, um, I mean, you, you, you'd be surprised at, you know, how much time, you know, the University of California or, you know, other, other um, ag schools have spent um, trying to find, you know, hey, what, what is this pest issue? How bad is it? When do you need to act? All those things, you know, we, they've, like Chris said, you know, it's been a couple hundred years where you have these, these, you know, these, you know, pests and crop complexes have been studied and, and there's good there's good guidelines for farmers um, on what what they should be doing, when they should be acting, how they should act. Um, for us, it's different. It's all brand new, which is, I mean, it's kind of neat, but it's also you know scary. <laughs> for sure, Chris. Uh, so, what um, anything you've seen in particular with tissue culture helping with uh, maybe um, hop latent? You know, as far as you your research goes, or what you've been privy to right no i think it's probably the only solution to get away or to clean a population of your plants basically that might be suffering from hop latent viroids so hplvd is funny it's the smallest pathogen really i mean not itself but viroid as a category of the smallest pathogens that we're knowledgeable about it's like a string of about anywhere between 100 to 280 nucleotides hplvd i think is like 260 or something like that of rna that happens to be recognized by certain defense mechanisms in the plants and targets genes in a way that cause the plant not to um you know you know the phenotypes uh you don't have a lot of frost on your on your on, not a lot of sugar on your leaves and the flower your yields the plant stunted it's very fragile <coughs> culture allows you the opportunity to isolate an area of the plant where viroids typically don't populate, the meristem in this case, 
you isolate marrow stems and you grow new plants out of those marrow stems. And you, of course, have to test them to make sure that they're clean. This is a process that we um, have are capable of doing in house because of our tissue culture propagation abilities. But not a lot of people have that because tissue culture is a, can be a very technical and to a certain extent artistic thing to do well. And so you have to really find specialized labor and have people that have the ability to go through with it because this also could be very mundane. I mean, you're taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cuts a day, putting them in certain nutrients at certain conditions and you know, always got to keep your eye on them. But tissue culture is the solution to being able to get around the viroid problem. But you also need to have though, is that you have to have good testing. I mean, it's a, this may seem like a funny parallel or, or a comparison, but like what we're doing with COVID, with testing populations to figure out where there are problems are, is exactly the same strategy that you need to take with HPLBD. You need to monitor and maintain clean stock populations. Those need to be tested regularly so you can take out plants that may you find infected. Uh, you have to maybe monitor and surveil your production line so that if, like for me, if we're sending plants out to a client that we know they're clean, um, and a lot of this is dealt so differently in the veg crop sector, or even say conventional agriculture sector, because there's regulations and laws and policies and guidelines that say, you know, if you're going to sell seed or these plants, either cross state lines or somewhere else, you need to show a COA that says it has been tested for XYZ diseases, and that if they have been found free of those diseases based on that testing, and that you may, that will allow you to either sell or export. We don't have a process. You know, that's I think something that's, I think that we can really benefit from. I think in the future, I think that's what's going to happen. I mean, I think probably nurseries are going to have to have some sort of certification being, hey, this has been tested. These are, are clean, clean mom stock, and here you go. Because, yeah. you know, we've all dealt with it as growers. We've all dealt with this, you know, with, right. have, I mean, right. I just, I, I, I mean, I've dealt with it for many years, you know. It literally decimated our nursery in, at, in the harbor side and almost had to start from scratch. And you're talking... Right. You know, it's massive scale. So I mean, well, got, well, you know, I, I actually, I, Ivan, on that front, can you talk about what happened and kind of how you built standard operating procedures to kind of minimize the possibility of things like that happening again? I mean, we would have to be, have real strict protocols, especially, in the, you know, in the nursery, because everything begins in the nursery. So um, we had to, you know, certain, certain sections, had to be divided up in the nursery and we uh, had to be really strict, you know, how we took clones as far as, you know, cleaning procedures, bleach, alcohol, um, and, and really being careful with the, you know, with scissors, you know, that sanitation part is very important. You know, I mean, I might sound like a broken record, but you know, just that procedure is very, you know, I can't even think because there's so many issues, you know, that, as far you know on that aspect goes um but no just being really really just being really clean you know numbering all your scissors and numbering all your mothers just having a really good system of organization that way you can have a watchful eye so that way you can trace you know if there's an outbreak you can trace you know from what mother it came from you know along with regular testing of course but yeah it, it totally kills your yield i mean it kills it about 30 percent you know you know very low trichome production you know just there's really no terpene profile you know it's very faint um it's just not pungity yeah and it just doesn't really smoke very well you know so um it's 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 a big problem you know so it it, it could decimate it, i've seen it decimate farms you know i've visited plenty of places in the valley it's a huge problem out here so um you know it's gonna it, people got to step up their game for sure you know as far as that's not easy either no um, uh, if you guys visit, um, you know, an, an indoor greenhouse, uh, organic, you know, uh, tomato grower, um, like I've had the, I've had the luck to do, um, that might be the level of sanitation that we need to start using in, uh, in, in cannabis, at least to the, at least to a point where, where this is kind of, you know, under control and we develop the protocols. Um, yeah. Um, you know, going, you know, we, we tried to get sanitation protocols at, at Harbor side. Um, they, they were decent. Um, uh, I think, I think we could have done a lot more, the bigger your operation, the more difficult it is to of course just uh, track everything, you know, you know, what Chris, what Chris is saying, track and trace, 
right? Where'd it come from? Who'd you, who did you clone from? You know, that's tough. That's it's really difficult. Um, right. Right. You got it. There's a lot of record keeping involved in that. Um, right. And that's tough for a big operation. It yeah, is. And it it kind of runs contrary to what they want to do, right? You want to maximize mm -hmm. your space, you can't be any flower. And then you have, I always say that like, no one ever likes to see the pathologist come around because I'm just about to tell them something that they don't want to hear. Um, you know, in addition, I just want to add to uh, what Saul and Ivan were talking about, maintaining separate, isolated, clean populations of plants that are tested regularly so you could feed and flush your system out and you have the main and you maintain the ability to access that clean material is key. They do that, you know, in many other areas of agriculture. If you just want to look at the blueberry industry and how blueberries are dealt with, um, they're a great prime example of tissue culture based propagated plants which are maintained by companies that have clean areas and then they sell clones off of those clean stocks. So you could always refresh and repropagate your populations. But you know, just to get back to what we were just talking about, that takes money and it takes up space and it takes up canopy. And if the investors or the, the, the pocket, whoever has the pocketbook is a little bit hesitant to want to you know, redirect their investment, it could really hurt in the long run because like you either make the investment now or in the long run, you may just have a whole entire greenhouse full of diseased plants that no one wants. So it's going to get nope. to that level. HPLB you, know, uh, you know, one thing I noticed with um, um, Hop Layton is that, you know, under lights, it just seems to just, I mean, it shows it, it, it's more apparent right away, you know, once it goes into flower. You know, because in veg, you can kind of start to see it. I mean, if you really have your eye trained, I mean, when you're, when you're looking at plants all day, I mean, it's... They can get fatiguing sometimes, but um, the, I think there are certain signs. I see like this kind of branching towards the bottom, towards the top, you know, I mean, it could just be, you know, strain dependent, but um, I definitely see it uh, just a lot more visible under HPS or LEDs, you know, in my experience yeah, and versus agree. just, you know, cause I think it's just more demanding on the plant, you know, right. as far as nutrient uptake, um, you know, uh, I, think, I think what you're hitting on there is is a key point, and I I, I kind of wanted to play devil's advocate here for a bit, but um, been working with a plant pathologist uh, who uh, works out of uh, TriCal Diagnostics and Hollister's named Steve Koike. Um, oh, you yeah. might have met him. Um, legend, the legend in the valley. Uh, a legend, right? You, you get it. Uh, so he's. Uh, I actually talked to him as well. I actually talked to him as well. We. We talked for about 30 yeah, minutes or so on the phone um, talking about, he was asking me these questions, what I'd see in the garden, you know, with, yeah. uh, with my observation. And I was, he was just kind of intrigued by it. So, I mean, he seemed very yeah, knowledgeable. So Steve, Steve gets a lot of plant, a lot of cannabis tissue. And he, he was one of the first to get the, um, the assay um, uh, for the hop slate and viroid. Um, and that's Steve and, Quakey, you know, right? Steve, Steve Quakey. Quakey. Yeah. Quakey, yeah. Quakey. Um, K O I K E, yeah, Trical Diagnostics. Um, so he, um, I've had numerous conversations with him, and one as recently as this last August, where um, he has been questioning this whole idea of whether or not um, the real problem with hop latent virus is stress. It's it's possible that we've got a viroid that is um, just an endophytic symbiont, an endophyte. Um, I actually, I'd like to know Chris's opinion on this. Um, basically what an endophyte is, is it's, it's a, uh, something that can be pathogenic, but normally just resides in the plant and is neither, it's not symbiotic and it doesn't take the plant's resources and it doesn't give anything to the plant. Um, but if there is some type of a stress on the plant, um, and we know there's any number of stresses, that's when you get the infection. It's kind of like um, <laughs> like herpes, right? <laughs> you have, if you get herpes, you have it for your whole life, right? right. Um, but it's, it's those stressful times where you get flare ups, right? And this could be the reason why it's latent in cannabis. Um, you know, it's not, um, what he was saying is, he has yet to find real correlation, um, you know, between, you know, dudding and viroid infection. 
which is really interesting because, you know, you might be hearing something different out in the cannabis community, but this guy's seeing tissue from a lot of, a lot of different growers. Now it's, by no means is it any like peer reviewed research, but that's what we really need. We really need for the CDFA to, you know, get the research going and, 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 and figure this out. Is it, is it stress related? Um, you mentioned certain strains, um, certain strains stress easier, right? They herm easier, right? right. So, um, you know, and it, I also, and then I also see just one infected area. I mean, the rest of the planet could be just healthy, thriving. Yeah. I mean, and then What's you just see, to, you know, what, what do you do when you see a, a plant that is classically dudded, but there's no viroid present, right? Or you see a plant that's beautiful, but there's viroid. Right. It's 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 interesting. So I don't know. I want to hear your take on it, Chris, on on this whole idea that that this virus might actually just be an endophyte. It's it's about keeping your plants healthy and not overstressing them. You know, I think there needs to be a whole other level of research, but I think you're on to something. And I have very similar theories about that. Um, I think that since the viroid is really just a small string of nucleotides and RNA sequence, I think what we're seeing is that we're seeing uh, the constant production of that uh, that viroid, and then the load of the viroid in the plant as it relates to the stressful situation is where you start seeing phenotypes. And in the, just to riff off what Ivan was talking about, the phenotypes are very elusive. In fact, we like to try to like uh, we like to kind of almost say that there's asymptomatic and symptomatic phenotypes or, or situations with the plants where you can have beautiful plants that test positive for HPLVD and you can have plants that are obviously um, obviously stressed and damaged and showing phenotypes that have to do with HPLVD. So I think it has to do, you know, just a complete guess. And I think we need to do more work on this. I think the stressful situation as it relates to the load of the pathogen or the titer, sometimes they would refer to in a virus, mm -hmm. which is I'm not sure you could really refer to the same thing in a viroid since it's kind of a different animal, so to speak. Um, I think the production, the load of that plant, of, of that viroid in a plant that's stressful is what really ultimately gets to the phenotype that, of the dudding phenotype. Uh, we need to do more work on that. I mean, a lot of these things I feel can be addressed by applying a lot of conventional research uh, applications and uh, next gen sequencing, um, RNA seq to try to figure out how and where this is a problem. Like, if you have a plant where you see maybe the viroid is causing a phenotype in one part of it and not, can we make a quantification of how much we think the viroid is in the place that isn't showing or displaying a phenotype versus where you can? I mean, there's some preliminary tools that we have to be able to address this issue. Uh, Who's paying for it is, of course, going to be a big question. Companies themselves, if you know they're interested in this, is something I always try to promote within my own business. Is like we need to do these investments to figure these out and share this research with other people so that other people could benefit from it because it could potentially be very harmful to the industry and the business if it's not regulated and controlled. And I think there needs to be a larger coordinated effort among people in the industry to address this problem somehow, some way, say agreed upon SOPs and, and ways of dealing with the plants that everyone follows. That's a very simple thing that we could do. But um, I don't know for sure. Uh, that's just my best guess. I think production of the viroid and the load of the viroid in a plant as it relates to the stress that it's experiencing at a given time is what where we see it. And um, it's a very elusive phenotype. You know, It's not until two or three weeks into flower do I really know for sure that, hey, this, this is going to cause a problem. This is definitely H. pill VD. But if you have really healthy plants, they may not necessarily display the problem you have. I think the problem comes in to what kind of a business you have. Are you making flower? You're going to have problems with yields. Are you selling plants or clones to people? Well, then you're just spreading disease around and people are going to get really angry about that once they find out that you gave them a bunch of diseased plants. So um, I don't know, we need to do more work on it. Uh, the, we have the capabilities of doing so until I can see more USDA NSF grants coming down to address this issue. I think this is all gonna be a completely privately uh, funded uh, matter. And uh, I hope that people share the information when they find it out because I think the industry needs to know.
Well, this is that that's the way that it's done in in regular agriculture. You know, you have, uh, you know, representatives of, you know, the grape industry or the almond industry or uh, strawberry industry. Um, and they, you know, essentially, you know, form, you know, these organizations, these commissions that, you know, the farmers all belong to and they they pay in. Yeah. you know, for yeah. the research. Right. It's not all on the state. It's not all on the EPA. You know, EPA certainly doesn't care about this crop. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, growers, cannabis growers thinking, you know, like the rest of the agricultural world is we yeah. have this problem and we want to solve it. And, uh, you know, let's get together on it and figure this out. Yep, you know, I agree. I've seen this many because times. there will be more coming. There'll be, right. you know, the a, a year ago I had only heard about beet curly top virus in vegetables. Now I've had two growers uh, bring it up. I saw a presentation from someone I think, I think it was in Tennessee who had uh, who had it in hemp. Yep. Um, yeah. There'll be more that you know exactly, and I hope people could understand that it's to the benefit of them and everyone else in the business by getting together and addressing this. And I think. We see that in conventional agriculture. I've been in the room where Bayer, Dow DuPont, Syngenta, HM Kloss, Cicada, they all bring their pathologists in and look, hey, this is the problem. We need to figure it out. What's the fastest way for us to be able to figure it out? Chip in some money, get an academic to do some sequencing. Everyone agrees to some standards that they need to uh, adhere to or develop a test. And they all help each other by testing, uh, do validations on the primers or whatever test that they come out with. And it's really important uh, that I think maybe we start trying to see a little bit of that in the cannabis business too. I just don't know how possible that is because there's various players in this business that have various interests in wanting to try to address these things. But I really hope that we can see more of those. I certainly uh, try to promote this when I can with my own business, but everyone's also, you know, they're hustling. They need to make money. They need to pay bills. They need to pay rent. Uh, but if these these issues aren't addressed, it's going to be bad for everyone in the long run. It really is. If if other crops with much tinier margins can justify it, why can't we? Right? It's no, divided we fall, and if and it could just if if it's going to be all about greed, then you know, well, good luck. You know. Right. I hope our tune changes because if. The industry is not going to do it. Eventually, the state or the federal government is going to slap down on it at some point in time. Yeah, and that's true. That's and now you've got that. quarantines, quarantine areas, and you know, uh, you know, uh, interstate commerce, and all of that's going to be affected too. And right. that, you know, that's really when people say, "Okay, now I've right. got these inspectors coming into my grow yeah. and looking around, taking tissue samples, and you know, they you know coming back to me and telling me, hey, you know what, you can't sell.'" you know, outside of your state now or whatever, because you've got this. Um, right. It happens in regular ag, so yep. why wouldn't it help it happen with us? It's just about, you know, like <laughs> the long game, right? Looking looking toward the future. Um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we saw that, I know um, I worked in hops for a bit and the whole Pacific Northwest has a quarantine that they will not accept plant material in anywhere outside of the three states in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, I think. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's a huge, I would never want to see that. I mean, what if California said, we're not going to take anything in from anywhere, anything outside of the state. I just, it, um, I think it would be a big loss for the business if this, these kind of issues aren't addressed and companies come together to try to, 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 to deal with it. I really do. Who, who just on that front, who would be some other companies that you pulled? I mean, you guys have some brain power in house. You got Reggie, uh, yeah. you got a whole team of people. I mean, I think of Kevin McKernan, medicinal, medicinal genomics. Who, if, if you were to kind of rally some existing players in the space, who, who would you say, Hey, let's, let's team up on this. Uh, I think it has to be the big producers. And then I think there has to be agreement with the technology company because our company, like I largely view my company mostly as technology in a lot of ways, almost biotech, um, to say if these things are developed, how can you provide access or make it easier for people to be able to run these tests? You know, like right now, I feel the domain of the testing business is to the people that can afford it. And to afford to do it at a large scale is a lot of money unless you develop these resources in-house which as a company we have. 
but not everyone has that opportunity and ability to do that. And I think the sharing of information to be able to allow more people to access the tests, to do the testing, I think is really important. But I think really a lot of this has to come from working with a lot of the producers, big producers especially, who like really stand to suffer if they don't address it. Uh, and technology companies and uh, diagnostic pathology companies to, you know, try to do the testing. Uh, I think we're going to see the same problems that we see with COVID. I mean, do you have enough testing? Did you, can we maintain the level of testing necessary to be able to address this at a large scale? Um, I think that's tough to say right now. I'm not sure. And again, it, if the domain is left to be the, the ability to test is the domain of that who can only afford it. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of people that are going to really struggle as a result of that. So I don't know. I mean, is there a California Cannabis Association? There's the hemp, uh, the hemp, the hemp council. Well, there's the hemp council. There's the National Cannabis Industry Association. Um, I think functioning as a trade association that represents a lot of these different entities, uh, it would be nice to see them take a lead and do something. But I think they're probably busy just dealing with like uh, regulation policies, uh, promoting promoting the plant and government. Um, uh, it's, nice it's too early. <laughs> yeah. It's way too early in the game. You're right. But I'd like to see that happen. It'd be good. That's how you, that's how they do it with both conventional ag. And I mean, uh, I used to work for a trade association and we took on those initiatives all the time, you know, Hey, this needs to be done on behalf of the industry. We draw up some money from Congress to be able to help fund it. Companies pitch in the deed is done. Boom. And uh, I think that coordination, that level of communication is really necessary. And Saul, you got a good point. I'm, I think there's a good chance it might be a little bit too early because right now people are just worried about complying, metric, selling, uh, finding new space, not having to sell their children just to be able to get greenhouse space. I mean, crazy stuff like that. It's just Competition with the black market. Yes, yeah, exactly. Compliance. Uh, it's, so would you so would you guys suggest uh, just having a really good SOP program and using tissue tissue culture to kind of help you steer you in the towards the right direction? Well, as as you know, sports? Chris Chris's comments on on the testing, um, yeah, that that's that is a way to go. Frequent testing um, that it's expensive. Um, hopefully someone comes up with a quick test, you know, even something that's only, um, you know, let's say 60, let's say 30% false positive, you know, or something like that. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just something that is quick and maybe cheap and, you know, a grower can afford to have the kit in house. Um, and then when there's any suspicion, it's like, okay, you know, I did this test. I know it's not that great, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to catch this early, um, then spend the money on, you know, send, sending it off. But uh, yeah, the sanitation protocols, again, you know, just, you know, follow the other industries. A, a lot of these, um, you know, uh, this disease, uh, the viroids vectored by, um, you know, uh, sanitation, like you're saying, Ivan, you know, it's, uh, you know, mechanical I know, that's why I got, damage. That's why I got lost. I didn't even know what to think. I was like, yeah, sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. Yeah, but oh, beyond that, we're talking yeah, about, yeah. you're talking about For scissors, sure. right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Those, those are, that's, that's huge. So, you know, you've got to, you know, get people to understand, hey, you know, that there's got to be, they do this in other industries, you know, they do this in um, tomatoes. It's, you know, we will move this uh, particular pathogen around if we're not good about, you know, keeping up on, you know, our, our the, you know, the sanitation, you know, training our workers. So that, that's where I would start is, um, you know, that's where you could, you know, vectoring it where workers are vectoring it. That's like, to me, that's where I would, would start. Yeah, uh, it's not not that it's easy. Right. Not that it's right. easy to do. Yeah. It's actually one of the tougher things to do. You got to get people to really kind of focus on what they're doing and realize the importance of it. But you know, but it, it would be step one. You know, you know, step two. You know, a lot of a lot of testing, um, testing your mothers regularly. Also, I don't. I'm, I wonder how wise it is to keep moms for like. Months would, and months and months, you know. I would, I would say, per, I mean, I would say no more than sixty days, maybe. Preferably. I mean, can you afford yeah. that? Can I don't know. Can I growers mean, afford that? I don't know. You know, it, it, mean, it's a lot, a lot of work there, right? I but, mean, 60, but yeah, I, ideally, but 
as you get older, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> as we get older, we're more susceptible to, to diseases, right? So, you know, the, the, the vigor is not there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, we don't really understand too much about how HPLVD is vectored by insects. I mean, you would think uh, that. Yeah. How, about a how about aphids? Yeah, aphids. Do you think aphids could be vectors? All right. So let me throw in on this one. Right. So you all are you all are aware of Fordon, um, the 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 cannabis aphid, the um, hemp aphid, the bang aphid. And Fordon's the the genus. Uh, there happens to be another Fordon, um, and that's the hop aphid. They're very closely related, as we know. Hops and and cannabis are closely related, same family. Mm -hmm. um, these are two aphid that are in the same genus. We don't know if cannabis aphid will feed on hops or hops will feed hops aphid will feed on cannabis. We just don't know enough of that. I don't think there's been enough literature out there to say that, yeah, they'll cross over. But of interest, there are studies showing that the hops aphid, cannabis humulus, will move the viroid in hops. All right. Is it is it that crazy to think that it's relative? you know, it in the same genus would be able to do the same thing in cannabis. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not. And it's something that, you know, um, it's so, oh. so far, like I oh, said, maybe not. this is worrying about something that's not real. Wait, you know? Sal, so, so, can, can you repeat what you just said? Cause you cut out for a second. Oh, sorry. On the internet rabbit hole. So this, can, can you hear me now? Yep. So, so this may be something to, you know, um, we're, we might be worried about it excessively, right? Much ado about nothing. Um, maybe the, the, for, the cannabis aphid, you know, Fordon cannabis can't move the virus, but it's, it's entirely possible, you know, and it's, it's entirely possible that the two aphids could feed on, you know, their non-preferred hosts. Right. Um, we again, we need the research. Right. Exactly. And hops latent had to come over from hops somehow. And I don't think it was because necessarily people were cutting oh, on some hops and then were cutting over oh, on some cannabis. Uh, there is some vectoring and insect transmission known in hops. And so I think it's safe to say that maybe it's probably going to be the case, but we need research to really understand that. We really do. I think the biggest problem though is mechanical transmission. It's dirty scissors. Yeah. It's late. It's people getting lazy about their sanitation, and um, it just will run rife through greenhouses, especially if you're not raising healthy plants, and it'll just crush your yields. Yeah, and I think we really like that's a good place to focus, and I think you know for people who can't or don't want to get involved in tissue culture because it could be a very labor-intensive, expensive process. I think uh, focusing on those, and as I said, getting some sort of a coordinated, unified effort regionally to get people to be hit, to adhere to those regulations and to the sanitation measures, I think would be a very good start to, to begin with. It really would. Uh, again, it's tough, you know, it's going to slow labor down. It's going to slow down the process. People don't like that because it's money. Uh, in the long run though, you might not even have any plants to sell. And so arguing that that theory is always going to be difficult, especially when you deal with the pocketbook. You know, I've also heard about it affecting seeds. You know, seed stocks. Anything you can uh, I've heard chime it, in on I've that? I've heard it doesn't. Um, yeah. I, this came from CDFA that it's not a seed borne issue like other viruses or fungi. So, the, the great question. And Saul is right on the money. And uh, in, there's a pro, there's in, in disease and pathology, there's this uh, like concept of transmission. And there's certain diseases that ha have high seed transmission and others that don't. Something that comes to mind immediately is bacterial fruit, fruit blotch and cucurbits. It's got this crazy seed problem, which is why it's a required and non-tolerated disease in cucurbits. Uh, this is something I think we need to take a look at, but you can, I think there's very, very, there is transmission, but it's very low. I want to say sub 10%. And I think we've seen that in our own operations when, because we crank out a bunch of seed on the hemp side and we'll evaluate, say, grow seed. This is just theory. Say you crank out a thousand seed, you're going to grow out, say, a hundred of them or even 10 of them. And then we'll do testing on those 10 or we'll do a sampling of the hundred and we'll see, you know, if we see some. And I, I can't say that we have really good 
we don't have really good um, anything that suggests or points in the direction that seed transmission is, is, is something here. So, you know, prospectively selfing plants, uh, which causes a host of other problems if you do it wrong, could potentially help you rid of that virus, but it gets back down to what we said before. If you don't have the sanitation, and you don't have those measures in place, you're just going to cause those problems all over again. That makes sense, I think. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just getting a little zoned I out over here. <laughs> I, I need a year of a mate. <laughs> True. I need one of those too. Yeah. So, um, any anything else? Any other trends you guys see? Anything you, uh, as far as um, you know, diseases goes that are going to affect the, the production of the plant? Mm. Well, I, I, my only comment on that would be that there will be more coming. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. That's a guarantee. So, you know. Finding the solution, you know, I mean, Ivan, you remember, you remember what it was like, uh, you know, russet mite, everybody oh, yeah. was, everyone was, uh, you know, was clueless about what to do. Um, took a little while, but more or less you figured out a, a control regimen that, that can keep it under control, not eradicate, but keep it under control. Um, and then all of a sudden the cannabis aphid showed up. And the first year it hit us, um, which was last year for us in Salinas, that was miserable. That was oh, like yeah. scratching your head and stressing about it. Um, You're like, what the I, fuck? We're like, yeah. what are we gonna do? I've never seen yeah, this before. And, and now we have now we have more information. I guess the goal is, you know, keep up on top of these on all of these pests and diseases, and you know, um, because there will be more coming. I mean, uh, uh, I, just, I um, you know, Oklahoma just. Um, legalized, I think, uh, med medicinal. Actually, I think it's rec now. I can't remember, but um, I think it's rec. Yeah. It, it took it took about two months, you know, by 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 August. You know, they they they, they were they legalized in June. I think by August they were already reporting for it on. You know, it's <laughs> and I've seen I've seen stuff I've seen plants in Texas with mealybug and and psyllids. <laughs> I mean, yeah. everything's coming. Everything's coming. Just you know, get to work on what what's there. Or get to you know, um, but just be ready. Just quickly, a little while ago in the chat, Strong Style Organic said, "With microgreens, diseases always come from bad seed stock." And then people started talking about kind of seeds. So, can you guys talk about? I see you shaking your head. Well, not not always. There are, there are seed bound diseases. There are seed transmitted, seed based diseases. Uh, but disease and pathology takes many forms, funguses, bacteria, viruses, viroids, and they're all transmitted and, and cause problems in different ways and vectored in different ways. And sometimes they're, um, you know, actually, sometimes they're insect transmitted and vectored, and sometimes it's mechanical. And it, uh, it's, See, just because you make C doesn't mean that you could rid yourself of many, a lot of disease, but it gets back to the point I think all of us have been hammering on, which is we need more research to look into this because we haven't even, there's a whole section of pathology which just deals with seed transmitted harbored pathology, just the seed. And there is an enormous industry that is set up around testing for companies that produce seed to make sure that their seed stock that they're selling is not diseased. And so, I mean, companies will get rid of millions and millions and millions of seed if they fail their testing COAs. And those standards have to be eventually applied to, um, to the cannabis business. The seed is not necessarily, um, I guess it's a long way of saying, and I don't mean to kind of ran on it, but the seed is not um, absolved from disease. We just don't really know about it. And we don't know about a lot of these things. And getting companies or producers to sink money into researching it is not a very sexy thing to do because its returns are mostly long term. And uh, I think people really need to, um, I mean, we need, we could use help from the academic part of society to be able to address some of these issues, but until they feel much more comfortable working with this plant, uh, that's going to be a long, that's going to be a long time coming. I think it's happening. It's starting to, uh, we need to see more of it. Here's, here's something I just thought about. I hadn't thought about this before, but um, this is a viroid that comes from, from a hops, right? Um, 
what's the research on hops seed transmission? Well, um, they're, they're propagated through rhizomes. That's, they're no. not propagated through seeds. Yeah. Right. Yes. Tissue culture. Tons of tissue culture. Yeah. On hops. I mean, the, the with the hops, this thing evolved where it doesn't grow from seed. You know, I think I, I believe they probably do produce seed. I don't know, but. Uh, you know, the, the disease is going to evolve. If it evolved in this host, why would we think it's it's a real problem in seed if it's not? There's there's really no seed in hops production. Right. You're right. That's propagation. Hmm. Um, and, you know, you bring up a good point, a really good place to start thinking about what the future of this of diseases in cannabis might be is by opening up a book on hop diseases, which is much more well-researched much more well-funded and much more well-developed than it is in the cannabis business. And think so, about how quickly, how, how, how long it took for hemp to be made illegal, right? So, <laughs> you know, that, and that was, that was how many years ago? You know, we didn't have PCR back then. We didn't have, you know, anything like what we have nowadays for, for doing, you know, microbiology research. So, yeah, good point. Um, look at hops, see what's happening with hops. See right. what, see what's, uh, I mean, beer has been legal forever, right? <laughs> Except for a small period in the 30s, right? Right, right, so yeah. Like, no, no, you're totally right, though. It's, I mean, that's a good place to start to try to look at what might be coming down the alley. But it's, I think anything is game. I've seen corn borers in, um, in hemp. Um, oh, yeah, that's coming. What the, coming. what the hell are they doing there? Are you kidding me? I mean, that's just, we learn something new every day, it seems. And the race to catch up with pathology, I think we're on a really steep curve in this industry. We really are. I mean, because hops, man, it, it really kills your yields, man. Like, I've seen it to be about 30, 30 to 35% somewhere, somewhere yeah. around that. Yeah. And um, it's just, I mean, there's nothing you can do around it. You know, I remember running tests in the garden with a few plants and just giving them some crazy amount of EC just to see if they would bounce back, you know, some of either Hermie or they would actually respond a little better, but you know, you can't deny that it, yeah. it was not a healthy plan. You know, right. just the development is just, it's, it's second to none. You know, you see a beautiful, vigorous plant, it's thriving. Then you see a really small rented plant, you know, that's on the verge of Hermie or it's just not keeping up with, with everything else in the garden. So, you know, yeah. we, it's, we can't, we can't remove the possibility also that, you know, I think someone brought up something very interesting. I think it was you, Saul, that was like, dudding is not necessarily conclusively connected to the LVD uh, viroid. But th that could very well be the case. What HPLVD could possibly do is open up the possibility of something else causing the problem because it weakens the plant makes it much more susceptible. I would say that on HPLVD plants, they're a million times more, and that's not really scientific, I shouldn't say that. They're very, very much more susceptible to powdery mildew. They're very much more susceptible to other problems. I've grown at uncharacterized lines and tents, and I would have the only, in the tent, the only plant that would display a problem with powdery mildew was the one that I knew had HPLVD. Now, that's not a great, I can't just use N of one to be able to say this causes that, but we need to keep our mind open to the fact that HPLVD might be the trigger, but the bullet might be something else. And so we, we don't know. Again, we really, really, really need more research. We need some more academic collaboration and we need companies to consider, I think, chipping in on, on programs and uh, I think on research programs or initiatives of this sort. Wish we could have some sort, sort of universal SOP, some, something that someone can develop and, and we can try to adhere to it. So that way we can reduce you the... Know. You know what, though? I mean, every grow condition. That's wishful thinking. And, <laughs> That's wishful thinking. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the, the cannabis um, consumer is just hungry for new strains all the time. And that's frustrating because it's like you start from scratch again, right? It, it happens to be susceptible to this now or that. And honestly, IPM, you know, I mentioned monitoring is a foundation, but your first action, finding strains that are resistant to your problem that's that's the number one thing you can do as far as a treatment action goes and when you're and producing and when this and when the when the customer base is just uh, you know just i don't know addicted to having a new strain um you know these kids they're they're bored <laughs> um but um 
but yeah, when 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 when, when that's variety's, the way they... variety's a spice of life, so I can't, <laughs> I know, I can't hate. I know, I can't but hate. hey, hey, let, let's just look at yeah, let's sure. look at wine, okay? Let's look at wine. Um, there's a reason why there's a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon grown out there. All right. And and very little of these other obscure varieties, about a thousand different varieties of grapes out there. And why is it that some but so many people grow Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon? Because it's tried true and tested to be an, a, something that's going to be economically viable. Right. Right? right. I don't think that's ever going to change with cannabis um, because, I mean, that's what it was like, you know, two, three decades ago. It's like the newest strain that came out. And and what we're seeing is, um, you know. People still love OG Kush, though. OG Kush. You know. We love OG Kush. OG Kush dream. all day. <laughs> OG Kush all day. You know, you bring up a good point, uh, Ivan and Saul, and that is, you know, the way that this is dealt with in grapes, is that there are publicly funded programs to develop germplasm and breeding stock, which contain certain resistant lines, which then they provide to growers and to breeders for them to use, which is another resource that this business doesn't have. And it's left to the companies or the people who are the breeders themselves to do that. And, you know, I think disease resistance, whereas an albeit very important, may not necessarily always be a priority on the list of the breeder. You know, they might look for huge terps, um, yields, um, crazy colors, you know, stuff like that, whereas it kind of looks past the need to develop a certain degree of resistance in the plant. And whereas in other parts of agriculture, there are publicly funded programs to help provide disease resistant stock to the industry, we really don't have that. And so until, you know, we have that ability or that's going to be a company by company basis. It really is. So it's uh, we, we could really benefit from that. I think, and I think we might get there, you know, as this business evolves and becomes more and more uh, like conventional agriculture, perhaps these programs might be out there to help out people. It'd be nice to see. I would like to see. I hope so. I mean, just the catalog of diseases, just to have a catalog that this is what we see. And these are papers. The literature is so frail. We were talking about LCV. Someone brought it up. I think Peter brought it up earlier, right? So there's a paper two months ago, comes out of Israel, talks about how LCVs is going to be this gigantic problem. It may be, but to be honest with you, either I'm not seeing it or it hasn't got out here yet. I don't know which one. And it's tough to necessarily diagnose because it really looks like a nutrient problem. Um, I don't know if LCV is going to be a problem. And this is an issue I think every company who has the ability to test has to deal with. And that is, I mean, how much testing do I do? Because you could definitely test yourself right out of business right out of business. And I've seen companies do that before. Yep. Yep. That's the paper. It was a 20 John D Dombrowski 2019. Okay. So it was just like, I think, I mean, how many other symptoms do those look like? Honestly, there's yeah, even a lot of them. Bit, maybe <laughs> there's even maybe a little bit of, of, of spray burn. <laughs> looks like spray burn in some, you know, I would have to agree with that one <laughs> for sure. Look at all that 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 intravenal chlorosis on that one <laughs> on that one leaf down there. That's just that's everywhere. So do we have uh, LCV? Yeah, I think, and you know, this raises a good point too. There's a lot of stories out there that people spread around about diseases doing this or diseases doing that, but it's not really backed up by research. I mean, I remember when I was kind of really starting to get into the pathology side of things, and everyone's like tobacco mosaic virus it's all over and it's fucking everything up man i haven't seen a displayed tobacco mosaic virus problem in any plant i've ever had to deal with i'm sure it's out there but the questions we also need to ask is is it causing problems to my yields is it causing problem to is it causing growth problems is it getting in the way of the things that i'm trying to do because many plants could harbor disease and they have no effect on the ultimate end of the plant so we need to be really careful out there and i'm not saying lcv is one of them but I want to see more data that suggests and shows that this is an issue. I really do, because um, I'm not necessarily convinced by what I see so far that it is. I have not seen anything out on the West Coast. That doesn't mean it's not here. And I have not detected or developed any testing to be able to address this problem. Uh, we have to go by the priorities of the company right now, for example. Our biggest priority is addressing and making sure that we provide clean stock free of HPLVD as much as we can. 
that's the biggest no that's a we know that's a problem we see it in the yields we know that growers don't like it we know that causes problems we need to address that um, are you going to be can't always reactionary that's the, that's the you, problem we can't always be reactionary to it are you guys going to work on some sort of a certificate saying hey our mom stock or clean stock uh, you know a little bit more information of, of uh, as far as um the history of that particular clone or team per se yeah the our production team does provide that in many ways and i think how to incorporate pathology into it is uh it's a tenuous situ it's a it's a tricky situation because uh people may ask for it and not really realize why they're asking for it it could also like put you in a situation where you need to always do it for other things yes i think that's something that ultimately we want to get to but how to do that like that structure is largely dictated that by the state or the federal level in veg crops you have to have an SOP, does this, does that, you know, it says this, and this is the information you need. And that kind of policy and regulation compliance doesn't exist in this business. So I think that it would be a healthy thing for anyone who's a good, who's a propagator in a, in a, in a, in a nursery to be able to consider providing and disclosing as much information as they can about what they know about the disease background. But of course, then if we don't know disease background very well, because we don't have all this literature, it's a tough thing. You know, we're figuring that out. I think H H HPLBD is going to be something that's here to stay and it's going to be a problem. And it's a good model for how we want to move forward as a business with dealing with disease. Really do. Sorry, I, I was muting everyone else because it sounds like there's a whale uh, like making uh, sonar noises or something. But uh, Am I? Not, while, while you were talking, I thought maybe it was coming from someone else's microphone. But anyway, can, can you guys talk about some, you know, I, I think you touched on some proactive strategies to make sure you don't get certain things. But for example, Saul, uh, you, you got to be reactive a lot of times when you go into a facility like you go into someone's facility and they have botrytis or uh, spider mites or you know powdery mildew or whatever it may be. So can you give some like concrete, I mean, obviously not throwing the cultivator under the bus, but like some recent examples of, of things you saw and kind of what strategies you applied. And you know, in the chat, people were talking about kind of organic natural, uh, you know, a lot of like KNF jargon and things like that in terms of uh, keeping plants healthy and keeping pathogens away and treating diseases and, you know, or, or are you reaching for the Marone and, uh, you know, can you give some examples of things you've seen this season and kind of your, your strategy uh, and, and then kind of the strategy you left behind, like the doctor to the patient, you know, keep doing X. And I muted you, so you got to unmute yourself. Yeah, um, for sure. That the the whole you know idea about uh, you know being reactive or proactive. Again, that that speaks to you know monitoring. How do you know how bad things are if you don't know what's out there, right? Um, establishing what are called, you know, economic threshold guidelines, you know, um, X number of spider mites means this is going to be a problem by week, you know, Y or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So again, it's, um, you know, I work in biological control. I, you know, my IPM programs are biointensive where, you know, you, you, you can integrate sprays and drenches and other practices, but the foundation are the predatory, you know, bugs. Um, and our mantra is biocontrol works best when it's preventative. Okay, you, it's hard for biological control to cure a problem, right? So what does that mean? That means, hey, how, how do you know you're being preventative if you don't know what your pests populations or which pests you have out there, you know, if you're not aware of that, right? So, you know, definitely um, that would be my advice to everyone. I, I guess I, I've been pounding that all, all evening long. Um, take, make sure you know what your grow looks like, what's out there, because, you know, I have seen growers reach out to me and say, hey, I bought $600 worth of 
um, spider mite predators from you guys and they didn't work. And with a few questions, with a few questions, I'm like, okay, well, did you see any webbing? Well, yeah, but only a few plants had webbing. Um, and uh, do you know what they look like? I mean, there are growers who don't even know what the spider mite looks like, actually. So, you know, again, being aware of what's out there, that's, that's the only thing that's going to prevent you from being reactive. Um, and if you have to be reactive, honestly, at, at least in California, and I know there's worse states, um, there are very few spray options that we have for this crop, you know, so good luck if you let things blow up. I mean, we've all gone through that, but, uh, you know, again, there, there are ways not to be reactive. I think it also boils down to, you know, as a grower is having a good plant count, you know, because sometimes, you know, having too many plants, it's not good. You know, too many plants does not equate to a greater yield. You know, it can diminish oh, your yield. You know, that's, that's like the toughest thing. I mean, that we can talk that's, about that for probably like five hours, right? It's this idea that most of the investors think, okay, well, you know, plants per square foot means yield, right? And we all know that the balance is somewhere between, you know, one plant, one plant per acre to like a million plants per acre, right? <laughs> because they will, they will battle each other, specifically they'll battle for light, right? So dense canopies, you know, the excessively dense canopies, I mean, come on, it makes, it makes monitoring very difficult. It makes spray penetration very difficult. It makes um, the plants can stretch and compete with each other and cause lower yields. I mean, again, the research isn't out there, but if we could just dispel this myth that the more plants you crowd into an area, the, you know, the more yield you'll have, you know, that's not that cut and dry. I mean, you want to maximize your space always, but you have to do it in a smart what way. What does that mean? You know, yeah, I mean, mean, it's, I mean, it's balancing, um, you know, just your square footage. You know, I like to do anywhere from, you know, two to three, maybe potentially on the size of the plant strain, all those variables. But, you know, I found that to work to my benefit, you know, and just really working the plant working, you know, with the trellis, just manipulating the canopy and just having the team go through that. You know, I mean, you've seen it. So, I mean, that's that's the name of the game in order to make up for any of that space that might, you know, not go unused, but not stack on another plant. Because I think more is not the answer, you know. No, I mean, they're solar panels, right? If you stack a solar panel on top of another solar panel, you just threw away a sol one of the solar panels, right? For sure. It just makes it harder for everybody, you know, the entire staff. And, you know, it's, it, yeah. it, it works, it works against you. You know, that's what, that's, that's always been the battle with, with trying to convince, you know, the uh, investors, <laughs> you know, so, um, but uh, what would you recommend for, um, for folks as far as like uh, an IPM program or how many scouts you would say, or how many times a week, um, just give um, us a little bit of rundown. I'll of what, give you, what, I'll give from, you a, from a just, basic uh, guideline basic guideline, okay? This came from two years at Harborside across, um, again, this is, this is gonna be an average and this was with very highly trained scouts. I mean, you know the quality of the scouts that we had there. Um, it was roughly four hours for every 10,000 square feet per week was about the minimum, right? So, you just do the math. If, uh, if that can work for you, it's not that bad for small grows, actually. Um, it's just those big grows where you're de dedicating scouting for one person all day long for two days a week, you know? Um, so again, that's, we did, we were just at Harborside, we were just about, you know, we were just starting to train our crews, um, our cultivation techs, on what to look for and how to report it. I mean, we were just developing those SOPs, right? Where if you see something, mark it and inform the scout, the scout can come back, let them do, you know, the grading, the, you know, the evaluation, how, how bad it is, whether or not it, it is even a pest problem, right? It's uh, so, you know, maybe you can get away with fewer hours if, 
more of your crew knows what's going on out there with pests and diseases. But yeah, that was kind of, that was kind of my, that's what I came, you know, what it came down to for us across a whole year. So the average is about four hours, four hours for every 10,000 square feet per week. With good scouts. Oh, that's right. And how, and how many scouts was that again? Uh, well, we were doing, I think we had at least one per acre, right? So, so you think that's sufficient? Maybe one, two, maybe I mean, max? I'll tell you that. Um, remember at, at Harborside, we were doing like some more upper division type biocontrol, right? We were integrating all of the banker plant systems and that kind of thing. And the scouts did that as well. They were in charge of maintaining, you know, those, those companion plants to try to support the beneficial right. survival. So that takes time too. And they were also involved in all the biological, um, all the bio releases, right? Um, so a couple of so times talk, a week. talk about, uh, talk about a little bit about the, uh, um, you know, the beneficial, you know, beneficials and, um, any other type of benefit, how should I say, uh, other types of plants that you would want, um, you know, that attract bees, for example, I know that we did an experiment, didn't we, didn't we have a plant that we grew at Harborside that attracted a lot of bees? I forget what it was. Yeah, basically. So oh, what I meant to say was, was banker plants, finally, yes, banker plants, banker there plants, you go. Yeah. Ding, 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 this ding. Is, this is <laughs> relatively new, right? Um, back when I started at Harborside, at least that's what it seems like, at least in greenhouses, right? But it's, I was doing what I had learned at the herb and vegetable greenhouses that I'd worked at before. Um, and lots of ornamental greenhouses are doing it as well. It's just banker systems that are just providing um, a bank, right? Uh, something that the, that the beneficial predator can use uh, to sustain itself when pest populations are low, right? And we had about five different systems going there at Harborside, but you know you could kind of boil it down to all right. Well, what are you looking for? Mainly, it's pollen sources, nectar sources, and in flowers that are tiny because the beneficials are tiny. They need to be able to access that those pollen, pollen and the and the nectar. Um, if you're talking about big, old, big, huge flowers, they're not going to be able to access it as easily, right? So, so I always uh, remember the bees. That's always like bees, bees, bees. You know, yeah. I, I love well, seeing the bees. Less, it was less about bees, even though we did have those strips out outside of, um, what is that house? Five, was it? No. I Five and one? Between the ben, 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 be, yeah. It was between the Venlo and, and, and Greenhouse yeah. Five. Yeah, so um, mainly what it is, is, you know, the bees were coming secondarily. What we were interested in attracting are things like lacewing, adult lacewing, um, parasitoid wasps, um, surfid flies that are that are predators of aphids. That's what we were really going for. The bees were coming because there was a nectar source and a pollen source there. If you have bees, chances are you have other pollinators. Some of those pollinators are going to be beneficial in the control of pests. Um, cool thing is, is that we, we were kind of new to it at that time. In cannabis, at least, there's a lot more growers now um, diving in. And I'm, I've actually got three indoor growers who really want to want to go into it and that's exciting for me because really that to me that's where it is it's you know it's about farmscaping right um designing actually that, farm. that's what we're gonna do we just cleaned up uh, our entire facility so it's everything is nice and clean so maybe next time when you come we'll have some some banker plants oh hell yeah man so I, got, I think um, that's there's I think some that's things cool. that I some uh, a conscientious grower like you that pays attention to this stuff that you know that's uh you know because you know it's going to involve some labor to, you know because you have to treat each one of those banker systems as a crop itself it's going to have its pests too right so you have to know how to treat them and how to deal with those pests so that they don't you know jump over to your crop right um the the, the easiest system in my opinion, is the use of sweet alyssum. And that's what everybody's kind of focusing on. They're doing it in numerous growers are not doing it in greenhouses. We were doing it um, at Harbor Side. And there's a couple of growers that are, that are now trying to do it indoor. And I'm like, I'm thrilled because I've never done that. I'm, I wanna see how it goes. Very cool, very cool. Chris, do you have anything else to add as far as um, 
you know, the future of pathology, you know, involving, you know, cannabis or right. how it's going to be, how, how that, how the two and two are going to coexist. I think it's, uh, it's always going to be a problem and it's a problem that's going to grow. Um, I think we're going to see more and more molecular biology playing um, some sort of a role in the process. Uh, use of qPCR, perhaps other tools and solutions from other companies, such as, you know, I know in the veg crop industry, if you want to do quick, dirty virus tests using a Agdia immunostrips, they're a really good way of trying to get, you know, they're not, they have sensitivity limitations, but they're a really good way of trying to understand, you know, if you might have something, monitoring, testing. I think uh, we're just going to see a lot more of these tools, which we see in conventional <laughs> agriculture over to um, to cannabis, and uh, I welcome it. I think you know it's a really unknown territory that we're getting ourselves into right now. And to see more resources thrown at it, more diligence, more discipline by growers to use these tools uh, and make make these tools available to growers, testing tools especially. I think it's going to benefit the whole industry, and uh, it's pretty exciting actually. Um, I just think it's a whole brave new world of of work, which I think academia hopefully will start pitching in to you know, start generating and developing more information. And while people hopefully uh, take, take pathology and uh, take especially these molecular tools a lot more seriously to address these issues. And I think people are gonna have to because just like we see with HPLBD, tools such as tissue culture is critical. Uh, sanitary measures are critical. Molecular tools are critical for, for finding the problem. So, um, I don't know. I think it's it's kind of exciting, and uh, it's really interesting to see um, what's going to happen in the future with these problems. But I think we're just going to see more problems, and it's going to require more resources, more tools, more discipline, um, and more conversations like this, so people can be informed as to what's going on. I think this is extraordinarily, extraordinarily valuable to be able to get the word out to people about what's going sure. on. I can't bang on that drum enough. I really can't. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate you guys having me on just to be able to discuss these things. You know, as a grower, you know, I, I love seeing uniformity when I go visit any type of garden or even my own garden. And then you see a couple of plants and then you go and then you go realize they're duds. You know, it's just kind of heartbreaking. So, how, you know, I just also when you think, does it affect, a, for example, if a plant is next to that plant that's infected, does that play a role in in how H, how, how it gets uh, transferred over? Other than the yeah. fact that if they're, cloning from it they're likely not to sterilize their scissors when they clone the neighbor right 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 for sure or even if ivan you're saying like if they're together in production their flower production, right there be... to say for example you know will it affect the hplpd affected you don't know um i'm not inclined to believe that's the case because i think hplvd is an internal problem that shows outward shows outward phenotypes that gives you an idea of what's going on. But, you know, I don't know, there may be, but you know, we, that's why we need a lot more research to understand this. I don't, I'm not inclined to believe that like a, a negative plant and a positive plant grow next to each other. We're gonna, but that experiment needs to be done. Someone needs to do it, figure it out. I can't say that I can cite anything that has done it either in hops and or cannabis. Uh, so, you know, it's something that we need to investigate. Again, we really, really, really need more research. Yeah, a point, a point I would make to follow up on what Chris just said is, you know, um, the cannabis community, um, you know, that it's, it's been in the dark for, you know, forever. It's, it's um, you know, it was black market forever. Um, it developed its own, you know, community outside of, you know, regular agriculture. Um, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of research based on a lot of the things that people understand. I mean, there's, there are crazy ideas out there. Um, and one piece of advice I would give is, you know, definitely do not trust Facebook research. All right. Go to ag, wait till it comes out, you know, do your trials. If somebody tells you something, ask for the sources. Where did you learn this? Was it just an anecdotal observation that someone made? Um, who was it that gave you that information? Is it somebody that also works like a Steve Koike that also works in, you know, 
a hundred other plants, um, you know, who's much more, you know, who would be much more of, a, of an authority on these types of, you know, on diseases and pests. And, and it's just unfortunate that right now it is kind of, you know, Facebook, Facebook research, right? Okay. So what are they well, saying? You know, the like russet mite, russet mite was uh, created in a lab by the government, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. People got to be careful. And, you know, again, 50, 60 years of prohibition does not help because it requires people to figure it out on their own. And if they don't have the help of the scientific resources and tools that are available to every other plant that we grow, then there's going to be very few answers. But we're getting there. We're, things are turning around. They really are. They are and fast. Definitely. Well, hey, guys, it's been great. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, just, b before you go, I want to throw something <laughs> at, at all three of you. Uh, th this was in today's New York Times. Um, so let me spotlight that. But ba basically, uh, it was an article on how the pesticide industry in the U.S. was influencing the U.S.'s position globally on the use of fungicides and uh, how the pesticide industry wanted to water down any kind of global agreements on the use of fungicides on crops. Mm. Um, so I wanted to get your, uh, I mean, I guess you guys haven't read the article, but the general gist of the, you know, fungicides and, and kind of what they do uh, environmentally. Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> Yeah, you you got you have two three more hours. <laughs> right, right. Um, so let me start off because I worked in policy for a bit before moving into science. I worked in uh, D.C. representing companies and did international work too. Like when I see headlines like this, the first thing that goes to my head is like, there's got to be something else to it. You no, know, it's not necessarily as easy as perhaps that 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 headline says. Uh, I'm not saying that probably pesticide companies did not want government or try to influence international guidelines for them to make their job easier, but it may be a subtlety or a nuance such as like maybe pesticide companies thought the language of that, of that guideline was unfair to their position as it relates to European companies or Japanese companies. Um, I don't know because I don't deal with that many chemicals and as a industry, we are really limited what we can do off label. I think it's a tough one. Um, I know I'd like to know more. That's interesting. I don't doubt that perhaps some of their actions may have been construed to be subduing guide guidelines at the behest of science. Uh, but I don't know, I'd have to read more to be able to really understand it. It just seems like when I see headlines like that, I'm like, there's got to be something else to it. And a lot of times with a lot of other things, such as GMOs, when you start really digging, you can see that perhaps there might be different uh, ideas about it, or there might be different perspectives on it. Let me just put it that way. But that's a really tough question to, 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 to address, especially with fungicides. Chemicals can do some good, really effective at addressing problems. We're not capable of doing that right now, of using that in this industry. And I think that's awesome because it's really forwarded a lot of research and work into the use of these alternatives, biopesticides, organics, to really address some of these problems. And I think we're further ahead, perhaps, than a lot of other industries and in employing those 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 tools. Uh, yeah, I I mean that's results to see that awesome point. Um, from the start of this industry, they've forced us to try to be sustainable. I mean, I've never worked I've never worked in with uh, real pesticides. I've only been involved in agri um, organic agriculture, and I feel lucky to be in this industry here because you know they are quote unquote, tying our hands. But what will come out of this, you know, hopefully in the next, next several years, when it finally becomes federally legal is, you know, a lot of growers that are trained on how to protect their crop without using toxins that are dangerous to the environment and the consumer and, and the farm worker. Got it. And, and, the, and uh, those are those are skills. Those are skills that are not easily learned. In a sense, the cannabis community was forced to learn them and is being forced to learn them. And that's a good thing. 
And lastly, Ivan, uh, you said you guys harvest every month and, and you're, what, what, uh, whose genetics are you running right now and what are you kind of excited about? Um, we're working with uh, uh, Chop Latina, which is a variety from Exotic Genetics. And he's awesome. I've worked with plenty of strains in the past and they've all done well, you know, because they've had a good, uh, the, our friends had a good pheno hunt. And obviously, you know, shout out to Wave Rider. Um, they provide us plant stock and we get a chance to flower it, you know, after it's been pheno hunted. And we found, we found some great winners. So, but I really like uh, Rado stuff, really Conorado. Really love his working with his genetics. So um, in particular, Chem Driver did phenomenal for us um and we hit about i think it was like 31 percent or 32 t uh, thc which is you know pretty high i guess um but for me thc score is, is irrelevant yeah it's strong but i i don't just judge a flower based on just thc it's got to have the whole package you know i mean i can indulge in something that's you know 14 15 percent and it does great for me so uh, but that's just maybe because I'm a little bit maybe more old school, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nowadays kids just want, you know, all, all gas, no brakes. You know, I, I agree to that to a certain extent, you know, for sure. I love my OGs. I'm an OG guy all day. You know, I like exotics just like anybody else, you know, variety is the spice of life, but I do like the old, you know, Northern lights, you know, white widows and, you know, skunks and, you know, those kind of varieties I still love, you know, especially hash plants those greasy, just stocky bushy hash plants that just knock you out you know i'm all about those so um but yeah but that's just kind of uh we harvest every other month you know where i'm at and it's just timing everything keeping a tight production schedule and then keeping up with compliance so i wear many hats so it's it's quite uh it's quite uh, a juggling act I, I would say so i try to maintain my cool and uh, you know through ups and downs things that break and how to troubleshoot and all that jazz, but you know, that's what keeps it fun. And um, I'm always up for the challenge. And, you know, I come from working in very large facilities, uh, about an acre, I think it was like four or five acres at Harborside, but I was running around two at the time. And that was a challenging, even with the Priva automated, you know, fertigation irrigation system, even, you know, having roots talk in our other house, you know, that helped a lot. So shout out to Tamara and those guys for, for roots talk. Um, but yeah, um, it's, um, I love, I love being involved in the, in this industry. You know, I come from the 215, 420 era, you know, many, many years ago in the early 2000s. And, uh, um, you know, it's been a way of life and thankful I've met such great people like Saul and Christopher and yourself, Peter. So, um, you know, there's a lot more to discover, you know, for sure. And, and the very last one is a more personal one. Tom, who, uh, some people watching may recognize as the home grow, uh, I was helping set up in LA just sent me some pictures and it, to me it looks like botrytis uh so if a home grower has some botrytis what uh Saul you're up <laughs> climate what climate Humidity. there's very very little like that I can do uh, there are very I mean if if someone had an organic solution for botrytis they'd be a billionaire yeah so uh, so, so so just to give context he <laughs> He, he's in the valley in Los Angeles, so it gets super hot. Um, but he's indoor, right? No, 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 he's outdoor. Hmm. So I don't think it gets that humid, but it definitely no, gets hot. No, but uh, again, what about a dense canopy? You have a dense canopy where there's no airflow. Um, that's climate. You know, you, you, you need, you know, you, to, you know, you've probably heard about the disease triangle. Um, I'd go into that, but, um, you know, botrytis needs uh, for its life cycle. It needs to have, you know, humid conditions at certain times for it to be able to germinate, sporulate, that kind of thing. So what's this canopy look like? You know, um, how healthy are the plants and what strains are they? Are they prone to it? You know, so they're, they're, any number of you know i'd have to see the garden i guess right. actually you can put me in touch with them because i live in la so what <laughs> yeah what? you're you're gonna come in as our ipm specialist on the next episode i'll i'll, I'll be back on wednesday no, for sure for sure i mean so if, you're, um, if, if you're around next week I'm, we'll film some stuff in tom's backyard this is the triage episode 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, pathogens are not my forte. I know, you know, I, I have taken courses and, you know, battled with all kinds of them in different crops, but um, I could talk, I could talk uh, about bugs all day. All right, let's do it. <laughs> right on. All awesome, right. awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Ivan, you rocked it. Good job. Thank you. A little kind of eh, wishy-washy, but I'm sure we'll do better next time. <laughs> you know. Sounds good. Thanks. So, so should we get next time, should we get uh, either Canarado or uh, Exotic Genetics? Yeah, maybe uh, we can shoot for, for Rado. You know, I'm going to be working okay. with his genetics for some time. So I'm um, looking forward to, to working the chem driver again. It did really well for us. So solid variety. I mean, not even one spot of botrytis and just got a little over two ounces of plant per it. So it did phenomenal, which is, you know, in a, you know, in a greenhouse, you know, but I had, I did have lights, so it was light assisted, but, um, but still just to get those numbers, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked for that, you know, cause actually in the Valley out here, it's pretty foggy and a lot of facilities don't have lights. So if you got lights and you got PG and E, you're, you know, and you're able to crank, you're able to crank out those numbers, you know, uh, with the right, right variety, you know, of course. So, so a lot of, a lot of different variables, but yeah, I'd love to be back and we could talk more about greenhouses. I got some other friends who ran some large facilities and operations managers and all that stuff. And it's just fascinating. It's, 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 it's a wormhole, you know, I mean, we can talk about it all day. I mean, all the trials and tribulations because, you know, we, everybody's had to make mistakes before, um, you, um, you know, become successful, you know, and some of them can be pretty costly, but, you know, you pick up the pieces and you truck on and you move on. And we all know that from that, you know, um, especially being at Harbor side. I mean, that was a, we did a lot of really cool stuff, you know, even though it was, you know, corporateville or what have you. Um, it was a good environment during the time. So was there, you know, I was there running the greenhouse. It was, it was, a, it was, we had a lot of fun, even though we, we did have challenges just like anywhere else. Um, we were able to really build a good team and you know that's why we still keep in touch because we always keep talk about you know bugs or it's just fascinating you know i love learning from other people so it doesn't matter you know new school old school you know there's a lot of good knowledge people who are just passionate you know and and just kind of want to help you out and that's pretty much my my two cents there <laughs> all right well with that we'll uh thank you everyone for watching thank yeah, you thanks. guys Peace. and uh i will kill the live stream